Village Girl, City Girl, A Duet, A Short Story, written by Shashi Tharoor. The Village Girl Sundar had never met a girl like her before. He knew the species existed, of course. At Delhi University, the term for its members was Behenjis, respected sisters. An ironic reference to the fact that no one in his right mind would try to flirt with one. They wore floral pattern salwar kameez with nylon dupattas and scarlet polish was forever flaking off their nails. They also chatted on buses in Hindi or Punjabi and spoke English if at all in an accent you could have ground dal with. Here in Kerala, you had to allow for regional variations of dress and patwa, but Sundar could spot a Behenji at 50 paces and though the word didn't exist locally in Malayalam, it was clear that a Behenji was what she was and horror of horrors, he was going to be introduced to her. He stood at the foot of the stairs looking into the long hall that served as salon, dining room, clothes drying area and thoroughfare in the ancestral home and cursed his lack of alternatives. It was bad enough having nothing to do, which was his usual condition on these annual duty visits to Kerala. It was decidedly worse having to do something he didn't want to do. His mother had summoned him downstairs to meet someone your own age. Knowing his mother, this could easily turn out to be a precocious 14-year-old schoolboy who wanted to talk about his stamp collection. Sundar peered around the doorway, the girl sitting with her hands on her lap next to a white-haired matron of formidable aspect looked closer to his real age than to his mother's usual estimation of it, but she was certifiably a Behenji. Making conversation with her was going to be even less stimulating than rereading the dog-eared Conan Doyles he had found in his grandfather's cupboard. Sundar swore in his breath, but realized there was no escape. He would have to put in an appearance for politeness sake, but he would be damned if it was going to be more than a perfunctory one, whatever his mother might say in that reproachful way of hers afterward. Look, I never wanted to come anyway, he would remonstrate again if she did so. As far as I'm concerned, this flight to the south every winter is strictly for the birds. She wouldn't get the joke, but there would be no mistaking his message. And they would subside again into the mutually resentful truce that always characterized their relations on these visits. Every year, without exception, his parents dragged him all the way down to their village homes in Kerala for what they described as a family holiday. This consisted largely of the elders talking interminably to each other about the misfortunes of people Sundar didn't know or receiving and paying ritual visits to people Sundar didn't want to know. As his adolescence advanced, Sundar tried to opt out of the exercise and was firmly told he didn't have an option. We have to go home, his father explained, to renew our roots. I may be working in Delhi, but this is where we are from and where we belong to. Sundar bitterly asked once why, if they wanted to renew their roots, he had to be uprooted. His father gave him a shocked lecture on the dangers of cultural deracination. When you are our age, he added, You'll be grateful we preserved your identity. Sundar's more pertinent arguments that home for him had always been Delhi, where he had grown up, not Kerala, where they had, were overruled without discussion. And so, 
he had to leave his friends and records and motorcycle behind in Delhi to vegetate with his grandparents in Kerala, eat pellet numbing quantities of coconut chutney and attempt to respond in his insufficient Malayalam to predictable jibes about the length of his hair. It was altogether unbearable. Today, Sundar's father was out tramping the countryside in a spotless cream mundu, a pair of thick-soled bata sandals, his only concession to urbanity, catching up on old classmates while his mother remained at home to a miscellaneous collection of distant relatives and nearby acquaintances. Neither activity had appealed to Sundar. He had lain instead on his string bed, trying with the help of Sherlock Holmes not to think about what he was missing in Delhi. When his mother's summons came, Holmes and he had not been entirely successful. Curses exhaled, Sundar walked in, making no attempt to conceal his lack of enthusiasm. He felt a stab of perverse satisfaction at his mother's evident disapproval of his sartorial standards. He was defiantly wearing jeans and a fishnet t-shirt, which his father said made him look like the villain sidekick in a bad Hindi movie. His father had only ever seen one Hindi movie, but it had been enough to provide him with an endless stock of stereotypes. The girl, however, seemed to regard him with the sort of light in her eyes. Sundar noticed this and exaggerated the indifference with which he dropped into a wooden chair and mumbled his hello. Naraini Amma is an old friend of the family, dear. His mother explained, indicating the matron who favoured him with a cursory glance and continued talking in cascading Malayalam at the top of her not inconsiderable voice. Sundar registered that the oration in progress dealt with the marital misfortunes of a number of good-hearted Kerala ladies who all seemed somehow to be related to each other and to the speaker. What a lot of adult delinquents the community had managed to produce, Sundar thought. Every one of the ladies mentioned seemed to have married a bounder, a drunkard, a wife-beater, an unemployable idler, or a crook unintelligent enough to have been caught with his hand in the till, with the prize unfortunate being the Kolengode women whose husband had managed to combine in his person every one of these deficiencies. Sushila is Narayani Amma's niece, his mother told him by way of introduction to the Behenji when her visitor paused for breath. Her mother's sister's son's daughter, she added with the precision she customarily applied to the description of such relationships as if The extra degree of accuracy would somehow render the encounter more full of meaning for Sundar. He briefly tried to trace the lineage his mother had outlined, gave up and looked away. She has passed her SSLC in the English medium, the formidable aunt announced with pride. Go on, Sushila, say something in English to Kamala Erdi. Sundar's mother smiled encouragingly, but Sushila only simpered her embarrassment, twisted her hands in her lap. Sundar rolled his eyes towards the transverse beams on the ceiling. It was going to be even worse than he had feared. But Narayani Amma was not one to let silences endure. Putting the brief diversion Determinedly behind her, she picked up her disquisition where she had left off. Sundar gathered she had now turned the powerful floodlights of her larynx on the dark sins of the younger generation. You don't know what things are coming to here, she declaimed. Just as bad as Hollywood, I tell you. Why? In Karanad Chandrika's Chechi's very street in Chitalamchari, 
Well, in the street just behind hers, a Naya girl committed suicide by drinking pesticide. Seems she had been having an affair with, you won't believe this, an ear of a boy, a common farm hand they wouldn't have allowed into their house. Someone told Chandrika Chechi the girl found out she was pregnant. But of course, she had to be cremated quickly, so no one will ever know. But why talk of Chitlam Jerry things are hardly better in our own backyard. Why? Just the other week, old Gopan Nair's daughter, you know Gopan Nair, Kalashiri Madhavan Nair's sister's husband, whose brother's son is working for Travancore Chemicals in Madras? Well, Gopan Nair's daughter told her parents after they had arranged her wedding and everything that she was in love. Can you believe it? In love with a rather fellow in her class, a Muslim if you please. Can you imagine? They had to stop sending her to school, of course. And some of the Naya boys got together and gave this Muslim a good beating and told him it would be worse for him if he ever came near the girl's house again. Apparently, he got some sort of laborer's job in the Gulf or somewhere and went away. But poor Gopan Nair, that girl of his is still refusing to marry anyone. Sundar stifled a yawn. The world of Narayani Amma's concerns could not have been farther removed from that of his experience. Delhi, at last his Delhi, seemed to be on another planet with his discotheques, its music festivals, its fun-loving chicks who modelled, who acted in plays, whose enamelled fingers snaked around his waist to hold him tightly as he raced his motorcycle down Ring Road. He broke into what was becoming a self-indulgent reverie and looked at Sushila. She quickly averted her own gaze. Behenji, she clearly was in her adolescent pavada and Davani, the long skirt ensemble with a half sari look worn by teenage Malayali damsels. Her nails were clipped and unpolished, her face devoid of makeup except for the film of talcum powder patted on by every rural care light, her feet bare. Sundar had no doubt he would find a pair of blue rubber thongs differentially slipped out outside the front door. Otherwise, Sundar had to grant she was pretty in a typically Malayali way, all cold rimmed eyes and dimples and long black tresses that wore the sheen of years of diligent oiling. He wrinkled his nose at the thought of all that oil. In Delhi, he wouldn't have given her a second look. He'd be damned if he would in Kerala either. Narayaniyamma was holding forth now on the moral standards or lack of them of a particularly winsome Valangi schoolgirl whom she swore she had personally, with her own eyes, seen in a movie theatre with a boy who was not her brother. It's all this education these girls are getting these days. All they know about right and wrong is what they need to pass their exams. Nothing else. I tell you, Kamala, it is all the fault of this communist government. The moment they insisted on free and compulsory education, I could see it coming. This is where I quit, Sundar decided. Not that they'll miss me, he rose abruptly from his seat with a muttered excuse me designed not to interrupt the visitor's conversational flow. Feeling in his hip pocket for his crushed pack of concealed Panama cigarettes, he strode towards the veranda that skirted the house. Sundar, his mother's voice called out, If you're going for a walk, why don't you take Sushila with you and show her the garden? He stopped short as if he had been lassoed and turned in irritation towards his mother. She had always had an uncanny instinct for the inconvenient. For Christ's sake were the words springing on his lips when he caught sight of Sushila's face. 
There was something in her expression, part awe, part delight, part anticipation, part nervousness, that changed his mind. Oh, all right, come along then, he said, and without waiting for her, he crossed the threshold. After a few paces, Sundar stood on a corner of the veranda and looked out onto the paddy stretching into the distance. Dusk was descending with the rapidity of the latitude, the sunlight curling off the edges of the sky. The palm trees bordering the far end of the rice fields were beginning to darken in the shadowy embrace of the approaching twilight. It was still the quiet broken only by the screech of unidentifiable insects. He sensed rather than saw the girl's silent approach and looked down to acknowledge her presence beside him. She was standing, her mouth partly open in nervous excitement, and Sundar found his perception of the girl widening to take in two more details. First, she was even shorter than he had guessed. She came barely up to his shoulders. Second, her figure concealed by the downy, but no longer distorted by her sitting posture was so close to female perfection as he had ever seen. Come on, he said in some confusion, I'll show you the garden. Without waiting for a response, he walked down the steps that led from the veranda to the dusty yard surrounding the house. The traditional fruit tree stood around the yard, mango, jackfruit, banana, all serving a functional rather than aesthetic purpose, but that was quite typical and not what his mother had meant him to display. What was special in this house was that one corner of the yard had been miraculously brought to life and unusually for these parts sustained grass and blooming flower beds. The family was inordinately proud of this triumph over both nature and custom. That said, he announced redundantly with a general wave of the hand, not quite knowing how to go about showing a girl a garden. It is beautiful, she said simply, and Sundar realized in surprise that these were the first words he had heard her speak. He could almost imagine her reciting the English sounds from a list of phonemes in Malayalam scripts. What those flowers are called? She was pointing to a cluster of bright yellow blossoms. I haven't a clue, he admitted, and I couldn't name anything else in the garden either, he added hastily. She laughed, a musical tinkle, and Sundar felt disarmed rather than offended. Then there is not much point in showing the garden, isn't it? She asked softly. Would it not be better to simply sit and talk, Sundaretta? Sundaretta? Ironic transference. The Behenji had gone and made an elder brother out of him. That was, of course, the Kerala custom. It would be disrespectful of her to call him by his name. Sure, if you like it, he found himself saying. But forget about this Ayeta business, Sushila. So I am only 19, for Christ's sake. And I am only 17, she replied shyly. But I am becoming 18 next month. That is my star birthday, you know, according to our Malayalam calendar. Not my date birthday. She was flushing as if she had said too much. Sundaretta, may I ask you something? Sure, he replied uneasily. This was going to be like no conversation he had ever had. Conversing as an ETA to a village Behenji in primary school English was going to be, he reflected, a whole new scene. Sundaretta, what is the meaning of this expression you are using, for Christ's sake? Sundar laughed. Meaning? It doesn't really mean anything. For Christ's sake, it's just an expression. And you're just using it again. 
So Sheila giggled. Look, it's just a way of saying, you know, emphasizing something. Haven't you heard of the expression, for God's sake? It's the same thing. God, Christ, what's the difference? But you are not a Christian. She objected simply. Are you, Sundareta? No, I am not, he replied, looking at her in some exasperation. They had reached the spot he had intended to escape to when he rose from his chair, a sheltered part of the veranda of the storehouse, out of sight of the main house itself, where he safely smoked the surreptitious cigarettes he still could not light in front of his family. But that's not really relevant, see? You don't have to be Christian. It's just an English expression. You don't have to be English to talk English, right? I mean, look at you. Yes, I see, she nodded as they settled on the smooth stone floor. But it is all very strange to me. Like you're always saying sorry and thank you in English. What's wrong with saying sorry and thank you? He asked, fishing for his cigarettes. Nothing, of course, but it is not Indian, she says. We are not having any word for sorry and thank you in Malayalam language. In our culture, you are supposed to show your sorrow or your gratefulness, gratitude by your normal actions and expressions. This English way, it is as if one or two words are enough to pay your debt, isn't it? Sundar had found his back. I guess I haven't thought about it that way, he admitted, taking out a cigarette. You see, you are not really Malayali anymore. She drew in her own breath at her boldness and asked anxiously. I hope I am not. How do you say? Offending you, Sundareta? He shook his head, smiling. But really, it is very English there in the city, isn't it? I mean, Western, modern, like England and America. Hardly, Sundar began, then wondered. Well, perhaps in a certain way. Hey, do you mind if I smoke? No, of course not, Sundaretta, the girl said. Sundar leaned against the wall, lighting a cigarette in his cupped hands. He shook the match out and the gesture sent scudding shadows across the girl's attentive face. It did not occur to him to offer her one. It was inconceivable that she would smoke. In what way, Sundaretta? In what way? Sundar looked at her and saw a beautiful girl no longer nervous at his feet. Her expression, laden with curiosity and interest, drove any coherent answer out of his mind. What do you mean in what way? I mean, in what way is your life in the city like the foreign countries? For once her words were halting. I can see you are so modern, Sundaretta, here in the village. I am knowing nothing of the kind of life you are leading in the big city. It must be so different. Please describe it to me, Sundaretta. I am really wanting to know. Oh, it isn't all that dramatic, Sushila, Sundar replied. But haven't you been to a city, not Delhi perhaps, but Bombay, Madras? She shook her head. Not even Kochi. I have never left the district, Sundaretta. The farthest I have ever gone anywhere was to the Guru Ayo temple with my Amma. That, Sundar knew, was about two hours from the village by bus. He had had to make the same trip a few times. My father is a marsh in the village, a school teacher. But don't you have any relatives in Bombay or Madras or someone to visit on a holiday? She shook her head silently and Sundar knew that holidays meant even less to her than this one did to him. In fact, they meant nothing at all. You could not travel very far on a village school teacher's pay. Heck, I'd better tell you then, huh? He suggested lightly. Big buildings, lots of cars, crowds, concrete, no rice fields, water out of taps and not out of a well, telephones. The nearest telephone connection was in a town 18 miles away. Sundar went on, describing stereo systems, air conditioning, chewing gum, television. Delhi was the only Indian city with TV. 
so though no one in his right mind watched the boring black and white documentaries it offered it was worth boasting about as the girl soaked in all in in wide eyed appreciation he became more expansive taking in the university coffee house and the house of parliament the sound system at the cellar the foreign dignitaries visiting rashtrapati bhavan her wonder about the city then focused on him as its principal inhabitant the questions became more personal what did he eat for breakfast did he know how to drive what did he smoke did he have girlfriends what were his plans after college he spoke early of not being able to decide between management studies and taking the foreign service exams and spoke with intellectual disdain of the cocktail circuit that both would condemn him to had he stepped out of a spaceship on mars he could not have been greeted with more avid and admiring curiosity each answer each trivial detail seemed to elevate him in her esteem he was unique her sole means of intimate access to a world she knew existed but with which she had no contact and yet sundar realized even as he spoke the access he offered was entirely illusory she lacked the framework the knowledge the vocabulary to translate what he was saying into terms she could relate to and evaluate she had heard but she had not really understood what do you do he found himself asking i mean you finished school right are you going to college now i no i am not going to college she replied in a low voice looking down at the floor as if ashamed of her answer i did well in my sslc but my father my father he does not believe in college education for me she shook her head violently it is not his fault he can only afford the fees for one child and my brother is more important he is doing bs in agriculture everyone says the future is in that it is costing a lot my brother has failed twice already and there are the hostel fees and all what is a girl going to do with a college degree anyway my amma says will it help me make better idlis for my husband but your father is a school teacher sundar protested surely he doesn't go along with that the girl said nothing then for the first time since he had asked the question she looked directly at him he says a girl has to graduate from homework to housework she said quietly i am getting married next month the week after my start birthday sundar did not know how to react married she was 17 barely out of petticoats his instincts told him to show how appalled he was his conditioning impelled him in the opposite direction congratulations he said formally wondering if that was another word for which there existed no malayalam equivalent they arranged everything she went on in an emotionless tone of voice he came with his family to inspect to see me last month i wore a sari for the first time and served them dosas i had made with my own hands they said yes and you did you like him he is thin and dark with pencil line mustache his two front teeth stick out a bit it was 4:30 in the afternoon but i could smell arak on his breath he was married before his last wife died no one is knowing how exactly he has a small child from her a 2 year old girl but why do your parents want you to marry someone like that because of all this these circumstances his family is not asking for any dowry they are only wanting a good homely bride 
who can cook and look after the house and the little girl it is a good family known to my maternal uncle and he is holding government job clerk in the collector's office everyone is saying we are very lucky and what do you feel about all this sundar felt the resonated urban outrage welling up in him as he stubbed out the half smoked cigarette ha huh? she would not answer avoiding his customary eyes she looked down at the floor unthinkingly he put a hand under her chin and lifted her face to meet his gaze are you happy about this he asked her eyes glistened with my sslc marks i was eligible for university scholarship she said tonelessly i only had to submit application i filled it in got all certificates from school only thing i needed was my father's signature i took the papers to him i said look acha look what your daughter can do it will not even be costing anything he took the forms from me and said very sadly so shashila you want to go study for 4 years then tell me who will be marrying you 4 years from now will we again find someone from good family with secure job and without dowry these are dreams child it is time to wake up and he tore up the forms sundar struggled with anger and impotence and anger about his impotence they can't do this he burst out knowing even as he spoke the words that they were absurd of course they could do this it was what millions of indian families did he saw the tears slowly overflow her eyes and begin to trickle down her cheeks helplessly one hand still holding up her chin he raised the other to her face to wipe away the tears with a sudden movement she caught it and kissed his palm soft lips pressed against the hot wetness of her own tears and sundar's free hand fell startled from her chin it was not a conscious motion and it should have simply fallen to his side but it did not it fell upon her breast and after that there was nothing any more he could do to prevent what happened neither of them spoke a word when they had rearranged their clothes and began to walk back to the house in silence it was dark there were a hundred things sundar wanted to say but he was too suffused with guilt and shame to find the words it was of course all his fault he the experienced city slicker he with the smooth talk and the plastic fantasies and the fishnet t-shirt had cynically taken advantage of an innocent village girl she had sought admission to his world and he had taken her body true he could recall no resistance to his caresses but the girl was probably too surprised to resist and too ingenious to know how to in the dark he had not really been able to see her face but her silence was plain enough he had ruined her he had destroyed the illusions of a simple village girl a nervous trusting young thing who called him sundaretta they reached the veranda of the main house in a few steps they would be at the doorway of the living room and it would be too late to say anything he could not leave everything unsaid even if expiation was impossible he caught her by the arm and in a strangulated voice spoke the only words that occurred to him i am sorry he said she had taken the first step from the yard to the porch and the moonlight suddenly beat her face it was lit up in the radiance of dreams fulfilled and her smile was no longer that of a nervous girl but of a woman who had touched a happiness she had not expected to be hers
a cloud passed, but Sundar found himself grateful for the darkness. Thank you, she said. Thank you, Sundar. The end of short story, The Village Girl.